Okay, so for the first question, uh, tell us a bit about your, your company or your companies, uh, what, what you do and, and how that came around. Okay, so um, I am director and founder of two businesses. Um, uh, in the main, we have the digital agency, the e-commerce specialist digital agency. Um, it came about uh, my business partner, Ketan Mystery. He, uh, he and I met at an agency, we think probably about 10 years ago now. Yeah. Um, he was a designer in the first instance, became a developer by him learning his own stuff uh, out of ours. Um, I was more on the sales and marketing, the account management side of things. Um, and we, he left the agency first, I left the agency second, and we stayed in touch. Uh, I was always impressed by his work. Uh, we got on well. We weren't best of friends. You know, we weren't going out drinking all the time, kind of best of buddies kind of thing. It was, it was far more of a, um, a mutually appreciative um, of our skills relationship kind of thing. Yeah. He liked the way that I handled accounts and the way that I was very honest and, and straightforward with people. Um, and we were both freelancers. We got together. Um, we, it was silly doing things separately. We decided to give this a shot. So over the last three years, we've had a couple of different, we've um, had a couple of different offices. We're now on King Street, which we're very, very proud of, given the uh, the, the kind of environment that we're in. Um, and it's dead easy to go out for a sandwich at yeah. lunchtime. Um, but then on the side, um, the reason why we're e-commerce focused is because ketten has been developing a product called Shop It for the last probably six or seven years um, when he was freelancing, uh, then when we got together in this. And it's, it's been massively redeveloped over the last 18 months. We're, we've created it into a separate business. So it's obviously a solution that we push to a lot of businesses yeah. um, who do e-commerce because we think it's good. Um, alternatively, we do digital marketing on Shopify and Magento and all these other platforms. Um, but we believe in that product. It's been cultivated by a lot of client demand. Mm -hmm. So a lot of bespoke ideas that will start off bespoke you actually realize the more clients you speak to, actually they want that element as well and then yeah. they want that element. So it actually becomes almost a package that um, that suits a lot of businesses. Not all, but it suits a lot. Um, so we split that into a separate business. We're refining the marketing materials of it. We're refining the um, uh, few migrations over onto it of our current clients, um, working out where it sits in the marketplace. Um, and hopefully this October, we're going to be doing a big launch for it um, at e-commerce show North. and. Uh, that will be the, the business that, that we get investment for and it grows and grows and the agency picks up work for, off the back of that and such like. So it's, it's, it's exciting stuff. It's, it's sort of organic. It's based on a lot of experience we've had. Um, you find your own ways of doing things. You know, we do things differently to, to the agency that we were at. Um, I'm sure we do things very similarly to, to other agencies. There's only certain ways you can do things at the end of the day. But our focus with the agency has always been very, very much on the clients, um, on the strength of those relationships rather and it's been a it's been a fault to some degree but rather than go out chasing lots and lots of new business we'd rather develop the current business that we've got um in a lot of tighter relationships and th those values are very very important to me and ken um and that's that's how we're sitting here today really so cool and and so what makes uh shop it so innovative or different i don't I, it, innovative uh, innovation is a very easy word to to use um i don't think it's necessarily innovative mm. um it's got a bunch of features that we know are a lot better than a lot of the startup you know magento community um uh, implementations mm. the uh, the shopifies of this world we've used those systems and we've used other other agencies developing that and then we go on and do the marketing and and what you know make demands of those systems um we believe it's better than those levels um, we're still assessing ourselves against Magento Enterprise and Shopify Plus and BigCommerce Enterprise and those others. Um, there'll be elements of it that are innovative. We're a Google technology partner, so we've got that back in, so it's going to be far more reliable and fast than a lot of systems. And I think a lot of it is UI and UX, um, and again, the client relationships, the pricing as well. Um, we're in a position at the moment that we don't have to charge tens of thousands of pounds in license fees. Yeah. Um, we just have to charge a fair price to enable us to grow the company. Um, I suppose the, the most standout element at the moment really is the fact that it's been born and bred in Manchester. Um, Kenton's now actually in Melbourne, so we're a 24-7 company in both senses. So we've got that support element to it. Um, but we talk to a lot of other agencies in and around the area because we want their feedback on the product. Yeah. You know, we want to, we want to um, curate it differently to that. So I'm not sure how, just how innovative it is but we do feel it's a lot better than what's gone before. Yeah. Um, and it's up to us to stay ahead of the game. And that, what's, obviously you say you came from another agency with, you, with your now co-founder. What's sort of your career journey so far up to this point? So from your first job? So he, he very much was designer. 
start off with. Um, I always loved his stuff. Mm -hmm. I always thought it stood out. Um, he's still the best designer that I've worked with. Yeah. He became very much more a developer. Um, he, he, he invented the We Buy Any Car brand, believe it or not, which he slips into conversation accidentally, forgetting almost that he's done it himself. And I'll, I always have to remember. So, um, so he's got some wonderful ideas. Um, and like I say, I was on the other side of the fence, really. I was very much more about people, about clients. My technical skills when I was freelancing were limited, to mm -hmm. say the least. And I realized that. I realized that, you know, as much as I wanted to be a designer, my sister was a designer when I was growing up, as much as I want to do that, it's not me. It's not the hat that I have to wear. So I have to accept what I'm good at, develop on what I'm good at, pick up on a few other things like running a business. Um, I love the whole um, financial accounting side of things. I love the whole... Um, economics of it the hr elements and the people and the clients kind of stuff he's very much more product orientated and fixing problems and solutions so when we shared that office together it just worked it was like two jigsaw puzzles just fitting together um, and i think a lot of co-founders will find that um, we don't step on each other's toes we've had external consultants come in um, who have said that it's bizarre that we agree probably 98 percent of the time on things They've actually said that's a danger because we're not challenging each other perhaps enough. But when we do disagree, we nearly always find a third way of doing it. We respect each other massively on that. And that's vital in business, certainly in partnerships. Um, all organizations, if there's one leader, you know, they have to learn how to run a business. A lot of people will start a business because they're a subject matter expert. Mm -hmm. so if I'd have started a marketing business, it'd have been what I say goes. If he started a design business, so forth. Um, but when you start bringing in staff and other people, you've got to realise that you're taking on a different role there. You're no longer a marketer or a designer. You're mm -hmm. actually a manager of people and you're a manager of an organisation. You've got jobs to protect and mortgages to, to, to pay on their behalf kind of thing. So, you know, you, your skills develop constantly. Um, so that's, I mean, that's, that's who we are as people. Um, and like I say, in terms of the, the, the career-wise, um, it was the shared agency jobs, the, the shared freelance time, really, um, and bringing it together and, and giving it a go, really. Um, you know, we all die one day, and me and Ken have both got young children, so you kind of look at them and you realise your own mortality and you realise your own responsibility. Um, and you do the best that you can for yourself and for them. I, I feel that I'm working on behalf, not only of my little boy, but of the, the little boy that I was when yeah. I was a kid. The one that that was starting things off, that um, that was trying things, that was creating things, that was getting frustrated and stopped by other people, um, and I've got the opportunity to give it a go. So, so going back to when you were a little boy, then. Yeah. So, I mean, did you? Were there any signs? Did you notice anything about the fact that you you just said that you were starting things? Yeah. So, and and this is this is self realization as you go on. Really, you know, when I was eleven, I did a Sabutio club at school. So um, it was all the craze back then. It was amazing. But I wanted to, to bring a few people together and have a league and have a club and do membership cards, you know, that's like your Kellogg's packet with something scribbled on one side and then your, uh, your cling film wrapped around it. Kind of that was the cheap form of laminate that I was doing back then. Um, and we're going back a few years. But um, then I did, uh, I did a magazine at school completely off my own bat. Had an idea, wanted to do it. I set up the school council, which is still active at my school now. Mm. I, I wrote a report. I was listening to a conversation in school. I wrote a report for the, for the headmaster. Him and the deputy read it. They brought me in for a mini interview. They told me what my, they asked me what my idea was about. I said, there are voices that need to be heard. And to this day, the student council still exists at the school, which I'm incredibly proud of and I forget about sometimes. I've done magazines, I've done uh, clubs and, and societies at university. And I've always been one to look for starting things off and trying to build something. Um, there's an ego element to it. There is, um, like I say, it's looking that kid in the eye that had those instincts mm -hmm. to want to develop something, want to build something and try and fulfill fill on it. Um, me and Kate have both said, as much as we would love to earn loads of money, it's not about the money. Um, it's about feeling a certain satisfaction and desire satisfied that you built something. Um, and I'm sure even when these two businesses are done or been passed on to other people or whatever, we'll find other things that we, we, uh, we want to do. It's, um, it's an instinct that, that you have, really. And that's the child, that's the kid that looking back now, I can look back at that kid and go, that's what you were doing. You were just trying to build stuff. Mm. And some of the clients that we've got, f fantastic entrepreneurs themselves, um, people who come up with ideas, um, some work, some don't. And you can see it in them as well. And 
if you break that wall and have that conversation with them about what the deep, honest desire is mm. to run it, then you've got a client for life almost because you, it resonates closely. A lot of client relationships are very much more the service that you provide and the price that you're doing it for and the aims and objectives and whether you succeed. But if you can cut through all that and you have that resonant, resonating conversation with them, um, it can be incredibly powerful and inspiring as well. Do you think, uh, do you think that instincts as all the born versus bred, uh, do you think the instincts you're born with? I don't know really. Um, I know there's the whole nature nurture debate of all sorts. Um, I think you need your triggers in life. Um, I was a council estate kid who didn't have a lot of, I went to a grammar school, so that was my chance. That was my turning moment. Um, I went to, uh, I was a council estate kid, uh, a mum, single mum, two kids, uh, doing a wonderful job of bringing us up. Um, but I had a turning point when I got into grammar school um, and it completely changed my life and my opportunities. But I was still sitting next to kids whose dads were bank managers and lawyers and whatever, and who, um, who had already had a lot of opportunities set out for them and fair play to them. Mm. Um, but there were skiing trips and saxophone lessons and all these wonderful things I just didn't get to do. Um, I had my little packed lunch of ham sandwiches or cheese and tomato sauce sandwiches with my moose to me and, and that was that. And But I, I seen kind of the other side and thing that I could be and thought, well, I could do that as well. Um, then when I went to university, kind of the same happened and repeated. So I don't know if that was a, a nature or nurture thing or whether the nature was bringing out, sorry, the nurture was bringing out the nature. Um, I don't know, really. Um, I'm almost too busy in my job to kind of contemplate anymore, but yeah, th there might be something in that. As you, as you were talking, I could draw parallels between okay. where I've been and when I've experienced something that I would never have had insight into. In your case, it was grammar school. For me, it was in a ski season surrounded right. by directors and company owners. Yeah. I had never spoke to these people, but obviously I saw there was something <clears> else. So that was quite interesting. I think a lot of people have aspirations. Mm. It's, um, and they should do. It, it gets you out of bed in the morning. Um, there's plenty of quotes about hope, you know, needing hope to, to, to keep going. I think, I think that's, that's a very powerful statement. But you've also got to see some delivery on that hope. You've also got to be the kind of person who gets out of bed and does it. Mm -hmm. The kind of person who's willing to take a risk. Um, there's a lot of risks in life, but certainly when you go into business um, or any kind of venture, really, it's a bit where you've just got to hold your nose and jump in. Yeah. As corny as it is, when I was going through my teenage and, and you know young 20s crisis, as, as a lot of people do, because you're going through one massive thing called education to one massive thing called life and all things that change. Um, I remember seeing the, uh, the, the Just Do It Nike logo. And as corny as it is, and as you know, it's all over the place. Mm. It was just three words. I just kept repeating myself, and I did a parachute jump when I was at school at, at university. Um, and it was just a bit of a hold your nose and just go for it and see what happens. Yeah. And when you get some validation out the back of that, when you take, when you have hope, take a risk, and actually get a bit of feedback from yourself to say that was all right. Actually, you try again and you try again, um, and it's it becomes a bit of a bug, really. So in, in, in starting a business, what was your just do it moment? What was your moment of just holding your nose, jump in? At what point did you feel that? I, at the old agency, um, a lot of good people there, don't get me wrong. Um, actually, the, the boss there, um, Eamon, um, I looked up to, I thought he was a great bloke. Um, but he was different to me. He was a bit more risk averse. Um, not saying that I'm massively risky, but there were certain things that I wanted to do and certain th ways that I would have run the, run the place. Um, Various comments you hear from, from friends, from family that doubt me as an individual and you want to fight back against that. Mm -hmm. Some people, um, competitively, you're, you're fighting against, against them and obviously you want to stand up for yourself. Um, but at the agency, there was a point where I kind of went, I've learned, I've done this now. Um, prior to that job, I'd sat down in a pub. I was at a bit of a career, um, more than crossroads. It was, it was loads of rows all heading off in different directions. But I sat down in the pub with a pint and I, I had a blank piece of paper and I wrote down, all things I wanted to do. Not just factual things like marketing or, or web design or whatever, but I wanted to go out and meet people, but not all the time. I wanted to meet them two or three days a week, but I wanted some time you know, studying and doing my own stuff. Um, I wanted um, to drive, I wanted to, to travel. Um, it's still my dream now that to have international clients where I can pop over and see them, and, you know, invite the family over for the rest of the weekend kind of thing and, and just little ways of life really. So I started writing down all this list and it boiled down into a certain type of role that I wanted to do, which led to the, to the job at Zen. Um, 
because it was an out, it was on the road job, but you had to follow up with paperwork and what have you. And and the excitement there was was help seeing that we could help clients and grow. Like I said, there were a few limitations with that business um, in the way that it did the business, not not in the quality necessarily, but in the way that it chose to pick clients and, and do what have you, some disagreements and stuff, which made me go, after six and a half years, I think it was, I went, I've learned plenty now. I'm going to go for it. You have a chat with the family and you with your wife and see whether you've, you've got the financial stability to do that, really. Some people don't. Some people take out credit cards to take that risk. Um, but whatever way you do it, you know that you're satisfying that little boy's dreams, that little, that um, person you've got to look at in the mirror every day. Um, and there are plenty of people around this, this world that still look in the mirror and go, I'm not doing what I want to do. And you start re- looking at all the, the cheesy phrases you know, about be who you are and live your own life and all this stuff that you see all over Instagram and Twitter and all these different things. And most of it's you know, bullshit, it's bull crap. It's, it's stuff that you just don't want to um, read and be told all the time. Yeah. But when you start doing that stuff, you realize where those kind of phrases, those cliches have come from. And they're cliches because they're popular phrases because they mean something. Mm. But, um, but yeah, going back to, the, to that turning point, that, that, those realizations, there was a few. You know, there was conversations I had with people where they put me down. There was opportunities that I had. There was conversations I had with people where they taught me up. And at the end of the day, you just have to kind of hold your nose and just go for it. And I think yeah. that's, that's a lot to do with your own character. Um, and fingers crossed it works. And so far, touch wood, this, this has worked. Um, we'll see how it goes. And what's, your, what's the biggest challenge been then for you so far? I'd say the biggest thing that I've been most grateful of is finding a business partner like Ketan. Um, somebody who's very, very different to me, very different background, but whose instincts are, and very different character. Mm. You know, I always say I'm, I, uh, he's the brains and I'm the, I'm the goal, basically. Um, there is an element to that. Hopefully I've got some brains as well. Um, but we fit perfectly together as a jigsaw and we respect each other massively um, and it just works. In terms of the biggest challenges, I mean, when you start your own business, as you might, will find out, will find out, is that um, when you've got no other job to rely on and you get out of bed, you'll wake up at six o'clock in the morning. There'll be a moment of stress, but you know but there'll be a wonderful opportunity of 16 hours ahead of you to do what the hell you want whether it's read up on stuff whether it's make phone calls whether it's go to meetings whether it's go to an event and learn stuff whether it's to sit in your bed and write notes about what's going to happen tomorrow whatever it is um it's yours to do with Hmm. but you also know that you've got to pay your bills so there is a huge and biggest advice that i give to anybody is to understand the essence of what economics is so supply and demand, because everything from a Friday night, looking across the pub at all the girls or all the boys or whatever, it's supply and demand. And there's quality elements to it and there's variation, there's all this, and it boils down to basic supply and demand. Um, but it's the same in business. So have a clear, simple understanding of that. I'm not just talking about you know elasticity of demand and all this kind of stuff. That, that's all great theories, but it's the simplicity of supply and demand. Um, but also accounting as well. You've got to have your fingers on the pulse of your accounts, your forecasts, what's gone right, what's gone wrong with all that, um, to be able to pay your bills so you can do it next day and the next day. But when you wake up at six o'clock in the morning and you know that the only way you're going to pay your credit card off or your mortgage or go out at the weekend is by money that you earn, which you've got to get from somebody else in a purely capitalist environment, you've got to work out how I'm going to get it from them or am I going to get it from them instead? Mm. Um, and it, it boils you down to some very, very basic things. Um, I speak to a lot of business owners who um, know that, a lot of business owners who don't, who talk about all these wonderful theories and books and um, events they've been to and, and stuff that that almost overcomplicates it. Um, or their, their particular chosen subject, they, they get to go into massive study. And that's wonderful, don't be wrong, as long as you've got the basics of, of how the world works. Um, that's kind of the biggest challenge, really. I think understanding that and then doing something about it. Where did you Where did you learn these um, the mechanics of of what it takes to run a business? So in terms of, where did you learn about the accounts and why that was important? How did you learn about supply and demand yourself? I mean, when supply and demand comes from, I did economics at school, so um, and I loved it. I just had a passion for it. Really did. Um, Never realised I would, um, but loved it. And I did philosophy at university as well. So you start looking at things a bit differently in that sense. You know, that's not a skill that you can sell. You can sell marketing skills. You can sell um, computing skills. You can sell whatever. Um, 
philosophy you can't but it's a way of thinking um, and a way of assessing situations and other people in scenarios that, that really massively helps but um, yeah economics at school uh, was a big demand and supply thing and you, you revisit you always go back you know, you've only lived your own life and had your own thoughts so you do revisit things that you thought of 10 years ago or some, some moments happen you go hold on I mean that applies to that and you always have these little wake up yeah. moments for it um, but in terms of the dynamics of, of running a business, a lot of it you learn as you go along. You have to jump in the deep end to learn how to swim. Mm -hmm. so that's another cliche. Um, one of my friends, um, you know, she, I think she posted on Instagram, I think, but she said that whilst it all looks calm on the outside, on the inside, you're learning new things all the time. Um, you curveballs that you just smile all the way through and you, you come up with a way of doing it. Um, there's still plenty that I don't know. Some of it I don't want to know, some of it I do. Um, a lot of it's conversation. I love talking to the boat business owners just about how to do business, not about their skill set or my skill set, whatever, but just about how to manage staff, how to develop your forecasts, how to believe in yourself, how to believe in other people or not, as the case may be, how to um, your brand, your positioning, just but the ways of of doing things and and the fear, the scary stuff. Um, it's been very helpful to talk to people and go, you know what, I've had a rubbish week. Mm. That client quit on me. I feel terrible that I've now done something really bad. Um, what do I do? And you kind of rally around and, and you come together with it really. But you don't really, you don't really learn these things until you get into it. My old agency, you know, don't wrong, I was watching. I was watching. Mm. Uh, other friends that have built businesses as well, I've kept an eye and I've watched. And I've tried to learn from the good things they've done and from the bad things. And when I say bad things, I mean things that I differ on. Yeah. Like, I've got a friend who, who runs an agency and he does some wonderful stuff, but I fundamentally disagree with some elements of it. But that's the way he wants to do it. I'll do it differently. Yeah. You know, there's multiple cars and houses in this world. Not everything has to be the same. So. Yeah. Do you think that's, uh, I think that's a big part of it? A, a big part of it is just learning as you do. do you think yeah, yeah, hugely. Yeah. Hugely. You don't, I mean, life's experience itself. You know, I could describe to you my, my massive holiday in Peru to the nth detail. I could show you all the photographs. I could stick a virtual red, you know, headset on you. Um, but you won't know until you've actually done it yourself and you've felt the aches and your pains in your body, but the inspiration of when the sun comes up and voices that you can hear across in other tents and stuff like that. You don't know until you've actually done it. Um, and like I said, it's scary. It is scary, but you've got to be able to vibe a little bit on that, I think. You've got to be able to love that little zest. And, and again, get validation back from it. Mm. If you take a risk five times and you get smacked in the face five times, you're probably not going to go for it the sixth time unless you're a complete sadist. Chances are that you'll get smacked four times and one will actually be all right and there'll be an essence yeah. of it. Um, so you have to listen and learn to other people, uh, from other people. Take as many notes as you can, stick all, all of it up here, but then you make your own decisions. Just because somebody's told you their way doesn't mean it's the way. I think, I think this is a, one of the reasons why a lot of people get caught up preparing and preparing and preparing and never yeah. actually taking action. It's because yeah. you can only prepare so much. Yeah. Um, so that's why I find just throwing myself in the deep end now is just like figure it out. Yeah. I mean, I went to university um, and I loved it and I thought it was wonderful. When my son grows up, if he chooses not to go to university or he asks me for a recommendation, I don't mind him just going straight into work mm. because I do think he'll have five years head start. Um, there is a certain level of intelligence and, and understanding and, and networking, I suppose, that you get from university. Um, and I don't dismiss that. But somebody who finishes school at 18 and, and goes straight into a job has got different characteristics. And they can run businesses perfectly successful. There's plenty of examples of the best you know, businessmen and women in the world that, that have left school or dropped out or yeah. done whatever. That's fine. There's still actually plenty of examples of people that have gone through all that education and done brilliant stuff. So there's no one answer. Um, you learn what's right for you, really by going through that thing. So. That's quite interesting. I was thinking, what do you, oh, I had to backtrack a little bit. How do you kind of plan for your goals? How do you plan your actions? And what's, how do you see it? So do you start with a big goal, what you wait up to it? Or do you take one step at a time? Or I don't know. I think with the, with the software, with ShopIt, we've got a big goal. We've got an end, uh, end game of, of what it needs to be. A lot of it is financial, size of company, mm -hmm. um, size of organization. But also being able to walk around that organization and, and do the, um, uh, I think it's the, it's the end of the X-Files and they say, you know, I made this kind of thing. And it's that feeling. Mm -hmm. However much money it's making, it's that feeling of, I've put this together, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, the satisfaction of doing something great. Um, 
it's just on a bigger scale than a jigsaw or a piece of painting or whatever because it's, it's people's lives that you're dealing with. Um, so that's got a, a quite a clear end game. There was a period where with the agency, um, the end game was lost a little bit. It was to grow it. It was, Kenton's got certain ideas about it. I've got slightly different ideas, but mostly they come together. We talked about having a 10, 12, 12 man team that was particularly creative and, um, and it was the way, way that you do things. Some people are best and love churning out stuff. Yeah. Tick, 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 done. And that's great. Some people want to um, have a 50 grand or 100 grand website where they can sit back and interview staff and um, of the clients and, in, uh, and interview end customers and, and really get an organic feel to it and be absolutely creative and have you know whiteboard comments and all that. But to us to get to that point, a 50 grand or 100 grand contract, you've got to kind of, often you've got to kind of work your way up or do brilliantly at networking. Um, and you've got to change your processes quite significantly. So some people want, will want to get all the money in quite quickly. Um, I've got friends who do a far wider net approach. I'll have 500 quid from you, 500 quid from you, 500 quid from you, and all that. Mm -hmm. It was very particular to me and Ketan that we didn't want that, especially me on the account management side. I didn't want 10,000 phone calls at the end of the week mm -hmm. from all these different people. Um, I wanted three phone calls. The risk there though, so if I've got three contracts that are 50 grand each, the risk of losing one of those contracts is huge. Hmm. And I've got to bear that in mind, but I've got to plan for that. And it, it's it's two sides of the same coin. You know, if that coin, sounds cliche, but if that coin is success, there are many different ways of getting to it. And there's two sides to it yeah. in terms of quantity versus quality. And, and you just have to go with your instincts of what you want to do, really. When you get out of bed in the morning, what is it your day, you want your day to look like? What is it? What do you see yourself doing in, I don't know, say five years time from now? Hopefully the platform's successful. Yeah. Hopefully, um, like I said, we've got the Melbourne office, we've got the Manchester office. Um, hopefully we'll have a, a Canadian or a New York office, which should be my ideal, because mm. I love that city. Um, I, would, I would want it to be a lot bigger, both, both businesses, the agency, because the agency will work, earn work off the back of, of, um, of Shopit, uh, as well as its own work in itself. So I'd like that to grow. I'd like to have people in position doing the day-to-day -day operational stuff, still be a very active director, me and Ketan, both being active directors of the business, yeah. leading it, but talking to other leaders that we've brought into the business, listening to their ideas and kind of almost approving those ideas. Um, the finances growing will be significant as well. But I wrote out my, my ideal, instead of my ideal day, which I actually ask every member of staff at interviews what, what I think they want to do. Um, it's a difficult question to answer normally, but I actually worked out my ideal month. Mm -hmm. And it is both agency and, and shop it. It's, there's a travel in there. I want to fly to Stockholm on a Thursday, stay overnight at a hotel, go to a great restaurant, Friday morning have the meeting, exploratory client meeting with somebody. Um, wife and son come over on the Friday evening or Saturday morning or whatever. Um, and then we spend the weekend there. I get into work Monday or Tuesday. We have a massive design rollout meeting, you know, about the project and stuff like that, or or a financial meeting with other directors, whatever yeah. it may be. And but it's it's being there and trying to pass some of my experience onto the team, seeing them develop, seeing the whole thing develop, and kind of moving that. But having when you're a business owner, your time does become a little bit more of your own. Yeah. It's first of all your clients' time because you're at beck and call for them. You know, I've answered emails at 11 o'clock at night. I've rebooted websites at four o'clock in the morning, all that kind of stuff, because I need to do it. But you do also get to go, <sighs> I'm pooped. Uh, last Thursday, I was absolutely knackered. I'd already done 40 hours mm. by Thursday, nine o'clock in the morning. I was exhausted. So I just decided to come in a little bit late. I came in about 10 o'clock, half 10, something like that. Um, but the ability to do that was wonderful. If you don't get that in a, in a day job. But I did that to look after myself. You know, well, there was a reason in it, um, and I think I ended up working late on the Thursday night. But you just pick and choose quality working moments as opposed to nine to five, Monday to Friday kind of thing, um, and that's enjoyable. When you speak to other business owners, having that flexibility, they still work. You know, directors of businesses, you'll see them come and go all the time. Yeah, they'll still work harder than anyone else in the business because it's their baby that they're trying to grow up. So. Um, uh, that's that's wonderful moments really so and i think i've asked you one more questions i was just thinking <clears throat> do you have three top tips for 
someone who's looking to start a business. But if you give three pieces of advice to someone who is looking to start a business like myself okay. or someone who's in the mix, what would you say? So um, I do think people are different. My way is not necessarily the right way. Um, people operate businesses completely different style to me and be perfectly successful. For myself though, um, when I was going into it or, or um, when other people are going into theirs, I think you've got to do your research. Yeah. Again, going back to the economics argument, it, most of life is basic demand and supply. Um, you are obviously supplying something to people or companies or whatever that are demanding it. Look at that demand, all the different levels of that demand, your cheaper people, your middle people, the more expensive people, um, the styles of things that they demand as well, what their remit is. Look at your own supply and where you fit with, fit with that, what kind of services you're uh, supplying, but then look at your competitors. So look sideways at your own competitors, mm -hmm. but look forwards uh, and backwards at your own demand of the customers and try and work out where you fit. Um, this is why branding is such an important thing because um, that slides you in at a certain level. And you can be successful at all those levels. Poundland, um, Aldi, uh, they're perfectly successful low-level companies. You get your Waitroses, your Ricardos, or you get your um, Aston Martins or whatever that operate in a different different area. Um, so look, understand your economics mm -hmm. is the number one. Um, and do your research into the market like that. Um, do write out a vision of where you want to be in whatever time period you decide, really, six months, three years, ten years. Some of it will be vague. Mm -hmm. What I actually did, one of the first things I did is wrote a business plan backwards. So I worked out where I wanted to be in five years. Then I worked out the steps I needed to just before that to get to that point. Mm -hmm. Then I worked out the steps I need to be here to do that fourth step. Then I worked out what I needed to do at step two to get to step three. And then what I need to do today in order to get to step two. So I did do a reverse business plan. Yeah. And that's financial as well as brand and who I want to, to target. Um, and then um, thirdly, I think it's said a lot, but I do think it's important to look after yourself. Now, that doesn't always mean having a lie-in, going out with your mates, going to the cinema, reading a book, taking time for yourself. I actually... Um, Thankfully, my wife appreciates it, but I actually know that my stress levels reduce when I do that bit of extra work. Mm. So I'll work two, two nights a week, all, all night almost. Um, I'll do 12, 13, 14 hour days. And a lot of people go, oh, you should look after yourself. And I'm like, that is actually myself. That's right for me. Mm. I've learned, you know, I'm um, old enough now to know better, but I've learned that that's what, that is what's right for me. Some people won't want that. Some people will work more effectively otherwise. But... Um, that reduces my stress levels, it gets stuff done, it, sometimes it allows me to kick back and think. Um, but yeah, know yourself as best as yourself. Don't just listen to those cliches and those advice, but actually look at yourself in the mirror and go, what do I want out of this? Because you're the one who's got to answer yourself, kind of thing, in, in six months' time. So. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much. Pleasure.